Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. We are excited to welcome you all to Mechanics Institute. We are joined today by New Conservatory Theater Center, which is based in San Francisco. We are thrilled to welcome our special guests, playwright Charles Bush and Bay Area icon Jay Conrad Frank, who is portraying the role of Lily Dare in the play that we are speaking about today, The Confession of Lily Dare. And they are in conversation with director F. Alan Sawyer, who will be our moderator for this discussion. My name is Alyssa Stone. I'm the Senior Director of Programs and Community Engagement at Mechanics Institute, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all. And it is a great honor to have these three extraordinary creatives joining us here at Mechanics Institute. For those who are new to Mechanics Institute, welcome. Mechanics Institute was founded in 1854 and is one of San Francisco's most vital literary and cultural centers in the heart of the city. Mechanics Institute features a general interest library, an international chess club, ongoing author and literary programs, and the Cinema Lit film series every Friday. Please visit our website, milibrary.org, to learn more about our upcoming programs, and we hope to see you again, both in person and online. This talk will be followed by a Q&A with the audience. Please add your questions in the chat and I will read them aloud uh, partway through our discussion um, today. So if you've got any questions for our special guests, please pop them in the chat and I will read them out loud when we get to the Q&A portion. You probably saw that this event is being recorded and will be available on YouTube later this week. The Confession of Lily Dare is currently playing at New Conservatory Theater Center in San Francisco, and NCTC has generously extended a 25% discount for any of their shows using the promo code MILibrary. So please use that promo code MILibrary for a 25% discount on any NCTC show, and we'll see you at the theater. I am very excited to welcome our special guests now. Uh, I'm going to read out their bios and then pass the baton over to our director who will be our moderator for the discussion. We are pleased to welcome Charles Bush, who is the author and star of such plays and films as The Divine Sister, The Lady in Question, Red Scare on Sunset, Psycho Beach Party, Die Mommy Die, and Vampire Lesbians of Sodom, one of the longest running plays in the history of Off-Broadway and some of the most fun play titles to say out loud, if I do say so myself. His <laughs> play, The Tale of the Allergist's Wife, ran for 777 performances on Broadway and won the Outer Critics Circle's John L. Gassner Award for Playwriting and received a Tony nomination for Best Play. In 2003, Bush received a special Drama Desk Award for career achievement as both performer and playwright, and was given a star on the playwright's sidewalk outside the Lucille Lortel Theater. J. Conrad Frank portrays the lead role of Lily Dare in The Confession of Lily Dare, and uh, in, this is his third Charles Bush role. Conrad is best known for his cabaret work as the Countess Katya Smirnov Sky. His monthly cabaret show, Katya Presents, is now entering its 18th year at Martuni's. Whether in couture or pants, Conrad has delighted Bay Area audiences and critics alike for nearly 20 years in such productions as The Rocky Horror Picture Show, Sweeney Todd, Clue, and The Hand That Rocks the Crawford, to name just a few. Conrad has also been seen at New Conservatory Theater Center in Buyer and Seller, The Temperamentals, The Divine Sister, Die Mommy Die, and Red Scare on Sunset. And F. Allen Sawyer, director of the production at NCTC, has been writing and directing in San Francisco since 1982. He is the author of Whatever Happened to Sister George, Gross Indulgences, The Trials of Liberace, Hot Pants Homo, Senator Swish, and Lavender Locker Room. This is the fourth Charles Bush play Alan has directed at NCTC, the others being Red Scare on Sunset, The Divine Sister, and Die Mommy Die. Additional NCTC shows include Daniel's Husband, 
Dear Harvey, The Temperamentals, Dirty Little Show Tunes, one of my personal favorites, Dames at Sea, and Xana Don't. Recently, Alan has been directing and writing gossip-filled narration for a series of musicals in concert, such as Hello Dolly, Mame, Hair, and Easter Parade at Feinstein's at the Nico. Alan is profiled in contemporary gay American poets and playwrights from Greenwood Press. We are thrilled to welcome our three special guests, playwright Charles Bush, icon Conrad Frank, and director F. Alan Sawyer, and I'm happy to pass it off to Alan now. Welcome, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Alyssa. Well, I'm so excited to be here, especially talking with these two brilliant artists. Um, Charles, I wanted to start out uh, just a little bit about your San Francisco history, and I wanted you to tell us uh, about the Valencia Rose and when oh, you came gosh. there. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I'm from New York City. I was born here, and, and then I um, I went to Northwestern uh, in Illinois. But I, I just uh, remember when when Armas and Maupin's first uh, Tales of the City books came out, and like so many other people, I just dreamed of getting to San Francisco. That just seemed like the most heavenly place on earth. And my the first 10 years of my career, I was a solo performer doing these rather elaborate kind of solo plays where I played men and women, these very elaborate narratives. And uh, my goal was to somehow get do my act in San Francisco and I had, I had a friend, Deborah Crane, who I knew from New York, who'd moved to um, the Bay Area and was working in arts and, um, management. And so she, you know, really helped me out. And she arranged for, for one night for me to do my show at the at Theater Rhinoceros. And it was a benefit for the Golden Gate Businessmen's Association. because She figured that would be a way of, you know, getting important people to see me. Uh, and um, that night, um, this wonderful young man, Donald Montwill, who was, was managing the Valencia Rose Cabaret in the Mission, uh, he and his, his partner, Jimmy Menes, came to see the show. And they thought I was somebody very important. And I, I, I didn't want to disillusion them. So uh, they said they were, you know, would, would I come back in six months or so and, and do my show, The Valencia Rose? And, Oh, they, you know, they thought I was just a very important New York person. And so I said, well, you know, of course, you know, I, I, I think I could arrange my schedule. So, so that, and I got to San Francisco and the Valencia Rose was just a magical place. It was kind of a, I guess a, I don't know, it was a cafe and a, it had been a former Spanish mortuary and they'd only kind of half renovated it. And the embalming room was still kind of upstairs. And, and I was, they gave me a room right next door to it. It still smelled like formaldehyde, but I was in San Francisco. And so, somehow, you know, um, I, got, I was embraced by all, all the sort of San Francisco press. And, uh, and it was my, really my first feeling of validation that, that maybe I wasn't deranged to try to pursue this career in, in the theater. And, and oh, I, it, it was just a wonderful time. And so I, I would go back to San Francisco you know, over the next three years, you know, over and over. And um, and so it, it kind of became a bit of a second home for me those um, during those three years from 80, 81 to 84. Great, great. And, and Conrad, you're a, you're a Bay Area native, but um, I was wondering to talk a little bit about your connection with NCTC and how they helped develop. Sure. Podcast. Yeah, um, I grew up in San Mateo. My grandparents had owned part of Joseph Magnin's department store, the makeup and luggage concessions back in the 60s and 70s. Um, I went to high school at Lick Wilmerding on Ocean and Geneva. Um, so I think of myself as a, a city boy, although technically I lived in the great city of San Mateo. Um, anyway, uh, when I finished college, I had studied uh, architecture and then gotten a music degree and I was a countertenor and I basically was like, I don't, I don't like singing opera. This is not really for me. Um, so a friend of mine uh, said, Hey, I'm, I'm doing a play at this theater, the new conservatory theater center. And I said, well, I've never heard of it, but that sounds nice. And they said, well, we've got a, you know, the, they've finished auditions, but um, they're looking for an understudy for um, several different roles. Now I, I've never understudied for anything in my life, but um, then again, I've also never been in the chorus, but um 
uh, I, I came in and I, I understudied, uh, and that was 2003, I guess, or so. Uh, and I, I immediately sort of got comfortable at NCTC. Uh, and then a year or two later, um, I had been asked to audition. I'd been flying back to New York to audition for Mary Sunshine in Broadway, on Broadway uh, in Chicago. Now, mind you, I'm all of 20 and change. Um, and so Ed coached me through that audition process, um, which I did not get. I'm very tall, as Charles will point out. Um, so I, you know, I don't always blend in. It's just a natural lady on stage. Um, you know, I, I can pull it off when I'm by myself um, or with strong actors. Anyway, um, so Ed coached me through that audition. And then afterwards, he brought up a, a program they had, a young artist program at NCTC, where they um, offered to develop this cabaret, this character I'd been doing at Martuni's for some years in drag, Katya Shmirnov Sky. And they basically paid for the development of my first four shows um, at my favorite basement in San Francisco, uh, putting me with a direct, a theater director, um, encouraging me to actually write material um, and work with a fabulous musical director. Uh, and it's because of those four shows that NCTC produced of mine that I really took um, my drag performing uh, to a theatrical level. Uh, and much of the material that I developed during those years, I still use week to week, month to month, performance to performance. Uh, so I'm eternally grateful to NCTC as they are my my San Francisco home and responsible for much of the uh, work that I've done um, since then. Great, great. Now, Charles, you and I um, came up in a time before the ubiquitousness of uh, VCRs. Did your love of movies come from TV, million dollar movie, or did it come from revival houses? Where, where, where did your love of movies come from? Uh, movies, uh, television. From, from yeah, exactly. Um, there was a lot, lot of uh, on network television, you know, in the '60s. Uh, you know, there was oh gosh, there was movie greats and million dollar movie and uh, the Late Show. And you know, I had this kind of odd childhood, like mo most of us, I guess everybody has. But in my case, my my mother died when I was seven, and uh, we were living out in uh, in Westchester, in a suburb of New York City. Hartsdale. And my father, um, my father's great dream was to be an opera singer. And uh, it, it never quite happened. And so he had, he had a record store in Yonkers. And he loved old movies. He was very much a kind of a heterosexual man with um, uh, stereotypical gay tastes. And so in the movies that he liked to watch weren't necessarily, you know, you know, war films or Westerns. They were, you know, what we know as women's pictures of Betty Davis and Greer Garson. And so he would, um, uh, after my mother died, we had a live-in housekeeper. And so she took my bedroom. And so since my father was you know, working all day and then at night was going through the ranks of uh, the women at Parents Without Partners, he was out every night. So it made sense that his room, I would move into his room. They could put double beds in. And, and when he would come home after a date, you know, 11 o'clock, whatever, he'd want to watch TV. And I really should have been going to sleep, you know. And so he would be watching The Late Show. And that was this great time for my father and I to spend time together. And so I really think I had most of my cinema education was uh, between 11.30 and 1 every, every night. And as it was, I had such I was so terrible in school, but I don't think it helped that I, I was up so late watching Random Harvest and uh, Camille. <laughs> but you know, it was a great you know it was a great thing for me and, and for Father and I. Yeah, and, and Conrad, your mother managed a movie theater, didn't she? She she was she was the mute the the manager of the. Um, Burlingame, the Fox and Bur I think it was a Fox in Burlingame in the late in the 60s, the late 60s and early 70s. Um, it was one of her favorite jobs, actually. Uh, and recently she gave me a giant box of movie posters that she apparently took home with her in like 1971, uh, which is very cool. And probably well, what, what, what posters what, for what? Um, oh, God, there's all the all the 60s Disney movies. Dr. Zhivago is in there. Um, 
Oh, I, I, I can't. There, there are lots. There are it's, it's, it's all, it's all from the from the sixties. From the most of it, the movies yeah. that she showed there. Yeah. Okay. Well, and also re-releases of when movies would be re-released to be shown for special events. Uh, right. uh, so, and I, funnily as well, have a father who loves uh, old movies and Barbara Streisand um, and going to musicals, uh, who, who cried when he saw this show, which was a testament to all three of us, I suppose. Uh, but uh, so I also did a lot of my early, uh, my love for early, for old, for classic cinema comes yeah, yeah. from my dad as well. Uh, that and going to the Stanford uh, Theater on Palo Alto, in Palo Alto as a kid, or in high school at least, we would go for double features all the time to listen to the organ and watch, you know, The Shop Around the Corner or uh, Madame X or Auntie Mame or, yeah. you know, Possessed. Right <laughs> um, T- typical childhood. Typical childhood, yeah. Yeah. Um, Charles, what... Uh, Tell us what the period of pre-code is. I, I guess pre-code is really was. I would say it's, it starts the talkies. I don't think we ever would consider um, silent films pre-code. It really is that brief period. I'd say between uh, nineteen thirty and and uh, thirty three. And what the code? The, correct me, Alan, if I you know um, get things wrong. Just that. Uh, the mo- there was this pe- period where there was great uh, uh, leniency and uh, subject matter and sexuality in, in the early talkies. And so uh, it was kind of a very special period. And, but there, the movies were always, there was, a, uh, I, th- I think, wasn't there already sort of a bit of a code in, in place, but then they, they were being threatened with uh, he- heavier censorship by like the uh, Catholic League and all that. And so the the uh, studio heads uh, thought that, that to, uh, they were so afraid that they, you know, would somehow really be screwed up by, by that. And so they decided to pl- police their own movies and they, they hired this fellow, Will Hayes, to be this kind of czar of censorship. And it was kind of an awful thing. It really did drain um, the life out of uh, American film for uh, many, many years. And, um, but there's a, that brief era of movies that uh, are early Barbara Stanwyck films like ba- Baby Face and, and Mae West's first couple of films. It, it, Mae West's career really was um, somewhat derailed. I mean, she, those first two films of hers, I'm No Angel and She Done Him Wrong, are so racy and so just marvelously alive and then when the code came in she kept going for another um what seven years but there was always you know she, at the end she kind of tur- turned very moral and it, yeah. she, she got a little chilly in her uh, yeah. post-code films yeah well so so we're here to talk about lily dare and and lily dare really is that the first of your plays that's kind of inspired by the pre-code era. I know you've done, you know, the forties, the fifties, the sixties, but had there. Oh, no, 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 no. Mm-hmm. I, I did a play called Shanghai moon, oh, which yeah. was uh, inspired by uh, the bitter tea of general Yen. Mm-hmm. So that was, um, that was de- definitely pre-code. Yeah. Um, no, yeah. I've gone to the early thirties, uh, uh, quite a, quite a bit. Yeah. But, but I loved, um, there's so many of my plays st- Come about because it's a movie genre that I particularly love, and therefore usually a role that I want to play. And I, I just, um, I, I always was, I've always loved Hollywood films where the female protagonist ages, and it's a great tour de force for the for the actress as she goes from girlhood to, uh, you know, off into old age. And there are a number of movies, not just in the '30s, but where you know, it's provided Jane Wyman or um, or Barbara Stanwyck or Irene Dunn with you know this great chance for a tour de force. So I always wanted to do that, and then I, I just you know maybe you know certainly you know since I lost my mother at such a young age, I've been so attracted to uh, m- movies you know mother love melodramas like, like Madame X. So so that was always kind of, and I, I actually um, 
I wrote maybe the, the first play I wrote for myself in drag when I was living in Chicago was called Myrtle Pope, the story of a woman possessed. And I didn't realize till till recently that oh, that's almost a kind of a precursor to um, uh, Lily Lily Dare. There were a number of rather similar chapters in her um, her tra trajectory. But but this time around, I you know I thought well if I if I want to do a play from to go from uh, starts off in young girlhood, I better do it now <laughs> as I'm pushing towards seventy. So yeah. So so Conrad, when uh, Charles writes a role that uh, starts off as a young girl and and goes through the ages, uh, at six foot, how tall are you? How I'm, hard is it to play uh, I'm six, the convent girl? <laughs> I'm six two, uh, almost. I might be a little shorter now. Uh, I'm wearing very small heels, Charles, very, very small, almost flats. Uh, so I don't look as monstrously huge. Um, I do often request that I be seated just at the beginning. You uh, didn't tell me, you know, when you were visiting me, I asked you this question, and I, I think you were trying to make me feel better. So you, you said, uh, six feet. Uh, maybe, yeah, it's almost six feet. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I haven't made, I haven't, uh, measured my height for many years but um i'm just over six feet tall uh six foot two at least in heels um small heels but um, and then you add a wig i do add a, add a hat <laughs> just just for for fun and giggles and i am at that point at that moment a mountain of plaid and pom-poms but it's glamour um i mean i think there's a certain level of disbelief that uh is attained and it's also funny because people will meet me in person and they're like I can't believe you're that tall like well you just saw me on stage towering over people I'm well proportioned I suppose as a lady um I'm like did you just think that they were very very small I don't I don't know but um, uh, I think it's all I mean height is what it is I think it's all in um, body language mannerism and gesture um and awareness that I, I feel like I pull off um, my 17-year-old self or 16-year-old self quite well. Then again, <laughs> whenever I'm in drag, I'm the only drag queen who, uh, when you meet me out, or actor playing a woman, when you meet me out of uh, out of makeup, it's like, wow, you're so much younger than we thought you were. I'm like, thank you, I think. Uh, Charles, in, in addition to writing a role that you want to play, you have a lot. I guess we could call it you have a stock company and 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 are you also you know looking for roles I know uh Jennifer Van Dyke you gave her so many incredible roles in this play and well it's it's I've always just loved writing for specific people and it's really started when I had my company theater in limbo and and it was like having a, a movie stock company uh, and or contract players, and it's and so it's been fun for me to um, to take people that I adore and you know very talent very talented and and try to often they're they're real big personalities and you know I call it their trip and so I have to figure out a way of allowing them to do their trip but also stretch it a bit because they can't just play the same exact part and with Jennifer Van Dyke she's sort of new to my my world well actually it's about 10 years now <laughs> and anyway she's a marvelous actress with um who's done many classical roles and and she has kind of a um there's a bit of a sort of young Catherine Hepburn kind of feel to her and a little bit of androgynous um quality and so with Jennifer actually I this is really been the first time that I I've actually written a number of uh, trouser roles for, for her and, and that's been very interesting and so when we did uh, Cleopatra I think she's the first actress who's had a chance to play Octavian and his sister Octavia at the same time so that that's been really interesting delving into this that world and, but it makes it her range is so uh, wide and I keep testing it that it does it does make it hard when the play is done and plays are done in other, other theaters and I think when they read I, I would imagine sometimes when somebody just looks in the in the uh, script and says, "Wait a minute," so you know, like in the Divine Sister, they 
the same actress played, you know, the grand dame, you know, uh, philanthropist, and also the little boy. But, you know, Jennifer, this is like the androgynous quality. She really could do it. She's so game. But, uh, and, and then in Lily Dare, you know, she, I, I just knew that, that physically she could embody, that she could be the aunt who is a very gruff older woman, but that she also rather effortlessly could play uh, the young daughter from 20 to 30 or whatever, you know, it's called for. And, and it really wasn't um, an effort, but I can imagine on paper, must like, well, how the hell did, the, did they do that? And Conrad, we've sort of developed our own little stock company, but we, but with Lily Dare, uh, we have uh, Marie was the only uh, one we could bring back. And what's what's it like uh, playing against someone that you've played with in this style before? And um, I mean, it's 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 a delight. It's always fun to share the stage with someone you know well. And um, having seen. Uh, the Charles do Lily Dare. Uh, Marie's a different type than uh, Jennifer is, and she really does a marvelous job uh, pulling it off. And she was our Bootsy in um, uh, Die, Mommy, Die, oh. and she was Julie's part in um, uh, Divine Sister. So very wide range of characters she's played, um, but it's fun to be on stage with someone you know well and you trust and you have mm -hmm. a, a lovely rapport with. Yeah, and no, she's so, so it's a wonderful feeling uh, when you do collect a group of people that, yes, that you all come from the same, have the same point of view, and that you could trust and that they aren't, you know, going to be trying to, you know, steal focus or out, out from themselves or, you know, it's, it's a, a lovely feeling. And it's also nice, especially doing a work like any of Charles's, where it could go one way, but it should go another. It's wonderful to have, um, to work with players that already know the feel of the piece, the, the importance of the melodrama, the importance of the, the serious moments versus the comic moments, when to go somewhere and where not to go somewhere. And I think Marie does that very beautifully and also never tries to steal um, from me or the other. <laughs> that, that, that's important. <laughs> well, Charles, I have an idea. Though. I got an idea from you, Charles, uh, that uh, when you you told me that uh, you'd had Alison Frazier as one of the voiceover actors oh, and yes. she had been in The Divine Sister. So I thought when we did the voiceovers, I would get some of our stock company that has moved out of away from California. Oh, good. Um, and some other actors that that I wanted to work with, so so it was a nice. Re we were able to record the voiceovers over Zoom, and we just had this, you know, wonderful. All my favorite actors got to uh, be involved in the play, if only as the voiceovers. So that that's that, wonderful. That was lots of fun. That was lots of fun. Um, Charles, do you want to talk about specifically some of the uh, movies that inspired the uh, Confession of Lily Dare? Well, most of them are, are very obscure, so it's not one of these um, uh, movie pastiches where you're you're hoping that there'll be uh, signs of recognition from the audience. It's a. Uh, I, I always joke that that I, I when I do a, a, a genre piece, it's you know I do subgenres. I, I not for me, you know, film noir. You know, I do I do some very obscure collection of movies that. So with this these kind of mother love melodramas, I suppose the great prototype was Madame X. And it's amazing that that, that in um, the early 30s, there were all these movies that basically were all riffs on Madame X uh, and very tightly that it, it was always a, a young a young woman, you know, has a baby that she, various reasons has to give up. And then the years go by and she has many adventures. And, and then after the, um, the child, whether it's a boy or a girl, grows up. You know, she she she, she make, they must never know her secret that who, who her identity is because it would sully their um, their current life. And um, and then sometimes it, and it usually ends up in a mur in murder. Yeah, actually, that she has to somehow protect uh, that child. It's, it, I think there's a line, I, I think I probably cribbed it from one of those movies, but maybe Madame X, that Louis Dare says that her, the only 
thing she can give her child is her silence. So uh, yeah, so it was Vanamex, it's a prototype. And then, oh gosh, so some of the other movies were, they all had similar titles to The Sin of Madeleine Claudet, which is, I guess in a way, maybe the second most known because Helen Hayes won her first Oscar um, in that role, but still it's not that famous movie. The, uh, so Sin of Madeleine Claudet, the- um, oh, Frisco, oh, Frisco uh, Jenny. Fris, Frisco Jenny, we, we took a lot because you know it takes place in San Francisco. Um, oh, what was it? The confession with something that like Madame Blanche, the secret of Madame Blanche with um, uh, Irene Dunn. Was, is there another one, Conrad, that I'm finding? Um, uh, the Audrey, uh, there's a little bit of Pollyanna at the beginning. Oh, well, those are uh, other little, little, little colors. But as far as the pre code uh, mother love melodramas, so I think those I, are the. I think key those ones. are the big ones. Yeah, yeah but so there are within, within that. Within that yeah, if, I, if I look through our text chain, I can probably find mm -hmm. the other ones. Right. Um, those um, are the ones I'm remembering at the moment. Yeah, but so as, I, as you I'm said, there, there, are other, there are other little other movies that are not in that genre that sort of affect the performance. Yeah. Um, I'm going to digress for just a second because you talked about uh, the Madame X scenario. And I, I, I noticed that uh, my birth mother is on this Zoom and um, we have just uh, connected a few years ago, but, you know, after many, many years, and she is going to come from Minnesota out to San Francisco to see Lily Dare next week. Oh my gosh. What's her and name? Where, where are you? Sharon Cadwell down. Anyway, so everyone who knows that, you know, I've reunited with my birth mother and has come to see the show says, Have you warned her? Have you warned her? Does she <laughs> oh know what gosh. she's going to be seeing? So. Yeah. so it'll it'll be fun. She'll she'll be here. Uh, in just a few days to come watch it. So wonderful. Yeah. Um, well, I take it all very seriously. You know, um, that's that's the thing, I guess, that separates my um, uh, genre pieces from, from maybe uh, s some other uh, parodies or, you know, I, I, I don't even, I never really call these, I, these plays spoofs or even satires, oh, okay. really, because I take the plot so seriously. And, and it comes from such an emotional place. You know, sometimes I, we talk about Jennifer Van Dyke's actress I work with a lot and a number of plays now, she's either played my daughter or my mother. And I sometimes think I need to, I should be paying her uh, weekly um, you know, sort of psychoanalytical fee for you know, a psychodrama that I get to act out when I do one of these plays, act out eight times a week, just these, it's rather primal things that mean so much to me. And 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 uh, sometimes it's very painful. It's kind of like picking at a scab, you know, it's just, there's, you know, I'm this motherless child and that's kind of a key event of my of my life. And so, so many of my plays in, involve reconcil you know, the fantasy of, of being reunited with, with my mother. Or, you know, it's, um, it's, just, it's very emotional. And, and, and so I try particularly, I think well, with Lily Dare and maybe that, this is the most I've delved into that. Uh, and so, you know, there are big stretches that, you know, I haven't seen your, seen this production, but I know like when we did it, there's stretches where it's very, very emotional. And, and, and we wanted, to, and we really wanted to see Carl Andrus, who, who directs my plays in New York. We, uh, we've been playing over the years with how the, the, the balance between um, comic melodrama and gen genuine, uh, dramatic scenes, and sometimes we've we've failed where we've gone too far in one direction. But uh, with with Lily Dare, we really wanted to see uh, could we uh, get the audience to respond emotionally as if they were watching ac an actual uh, old movie on TCM. And 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 I was delighted when, as much as I love hearing the sound of laughter, but hearing people sniffling and that, yeah, that, that was very rewarding. I, I've had a lot of comments from audience members is I didn't expect to be touched or moved or and so that's been really, really wonderful for us. Um, During the birth so, process, I kept asking Alan, "I'm like, am I am I going to dock here? I've from act you know act two scene two to the end is I mean, there's some funny stuff of course, but it's you know it, it's it's very serious and it uh, I'm using my acting um, and it's 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 just a joy um, to give some genuine emotion 
Uh, there's a lot of funny stuff, but there's a lot of really moving stuff in both acts, but especially around um, Lily's yeah. daughter. It's just it's just an absolute joy mm -hmm. to get to sink your teeth into a role that's so uh, meaty and so uh, allows you allows me to do all the things that I think I do best, which is singing and comedy and drama. You know, it's it's an absolute pleasure. So so Conrad, you had the great opportunity to go to New York and, and meet with Charles. And I, I, I should preface this, Charles, we did a talk back after the show Sunday, and I told the audience that uh, any other actor other than Conrad, I would not have uh, trusted to do that because they would have come back and done just a, a weak imitation of you. But Conrad was able to, I think, learn and 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 still keep things his own. But uh, Conrad, do you want to tell us what that was like working um, was, with the playwright? It was, I mean, it was incredible. I, I was, I was Agnes Gooching uh, to Charles. <laughs> I was his sponge. Um, and for, it all happened very quickly. We were, it was December and, you know, Charles had offered this and basically he's like, oh, um, I've got some time in two weeks. Do you want to come out for four days? And I was like, yes, yes, I will go. Um, and we sat in his beautiful apartment in Greenwich Village uh, for several hours, for several days in a row, and talked and read through the entire play. Um, and also talked about a million other things as well. But it was um, incredible understand getting to understand where each of these moments come from. Um, and there's so much, Charles writes beautifully for himself. I and mean, he writes beautifully, beautifully for anyone. But there's so much um, in, the, in Charles's delivery um, of lines that allows, uh, that informs the audience of what's really being meant here. So there were, it was just wonderful to work through passages, being right, slow down here. Here's where we emphasize, this is what this really means. Um, always with the permission to do whatever I needed to, but with the great, uh, it was an incredible opportunity. Of course, sorry, let me just turn that off. Thank you. So I'm at my office, everyone watching. Um, I hope that was not an important call. Um, it, it was remarkable opportunity and um, one I'll never forget. I just learned so much uh, when not to let the audience laugh, uh, when to um, not do anything cheap, uh, reminding me that you have to act through these moments if you want the full payoff of the piece. And it was I hope I get to do it again. So yeah, it's just, I, I wasn't going to, at one point, um, you know, I wasn't going to actually have the play published or, or available for other productions because it was so, um, it was so difficult, you know, challenging. I, I know I've been doing this for 40 years, but uh, this balance of drama and comedy was very, very delicate. And, and there were moments in the play in New York just that, where um, let's say Jennifer's character would get a big laugh, and I could you could I could feel that the but and right after that laugh we go into a stretch where it's supposed to be quite touching, but I, I could feel the audience expecting that I was going to sort of top her laugh or or that I would make some sort of a face you know, a funny to comment on on what she had the outrageous thing that she had just said, but I did I didn't want to go there because then we would. You know, be off to the races, and we'd never get them back. And and it, it took, you know, it's such control and 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 timing of of uh, pa pausing to give the audience enough time to get okay, settle back. That oh, he's not going to go there. He's you know, we're we're back in dramatic scene. It, it was it was hard, and you know, and once once in a while, you know, um, you know, it's in lion taming, I guess. You know the the lions you know, roars but you know there are a few, you know, a few times where people get carried away with with their laughter and I and you know and, you know and they didn't take my cue but but mostly it, it, it always worked but those are things that I you know I wanted to give Conrad and and uh, I also um, you know my the roles I write for myself I write so specifically for myself that um, that when you read the play, people would think, oh, I've heard people say to me when they've read, read one of my plays, you certainly didn't give yourself very, 
a very funny role. I write it pretty much straight because I know what I'm going to do. I know that I'll, on this line, I'm going to evoke Betty Davis or here I'm going to get, I could get a laugh from some sort of, sort of vocal trick of mine. And, and so that, um, so it's hard when the plays are done elsewhere. Sometimes the, um, the person playing my role doesn't know. So, he, so they're, they're not that funny, but, but first of all, Conrad, Conrad's very skilled. But also, I was able to give him, you know, or show him the various actresses that I was evoking on a line where that's where that's where my the laugh comes in, not from what I'm saying. Yeah, and there were, I mean, incredible uh, knowledge shared just on the importance of um, honoring the moment in the play, where it'd be very easy to get a cheap laugh out of a moment where that's not what's required there. Also knowing that, I mean, just knowing that the audience may laugh in a certain spot and that what I say following that moment has to be dead yeah. serious and sincere. There are two moments in specific, specifically that I'm thinking of in the play. I think Charles knows which ones they are and I think Alan does too. I don't want to ruin it for anyone who might come and see it, but there, there's a funny sound cue um, where the audience, depending on how you set it up, could burst into laughter or be totally still. And generally we've had audiences that have got that moment. Although the other night someone said audibly from the first row, did she kill the baby? <laughs> uh, which it was- can't, It can't be a hundred percent, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it was, it was, it was, it was wonderful. Um, and uh, it was permission, I think, to uh, really act or to really be in the moment and the seriousness of the play. Well, I mean, a lot of these moments, there's a big funny moment before, and then you have to bring it back to the seriousness of the scene. And it was wonderful to learn that um, from Charles. And it, yeah, just an incredible experience. Because essentially with these, these plays I've written for, for myself, um, you know, I, I just want to, you know, a big part of it is that I want to play that part. I, I want to play, do this Barbara Stanwyck uh, kind of role, you know, and, and sometimes I feel like, well, I have to cut to, to do that. I, I have to also have a, a level of, of uh, parody to it, but uh, and exaggerate various things, but and have fun with it. But I, the, the main thing is I, I want to play that role. So, so there's going to be stretches where I just get to, just to play it. Yeah. So Charles, I I uh, heard a, another interview that uh, you did, and I I wanted to ask you to repeat a story. Um, I think it was a college production of the Lady in Question, and you asked uh, the actor playing your role if they'd um, watch the movies that that you were referencing. Do you remember that story? Not specifically. It might have been at this one university where they brought me out to. Uh... Yeah. Well, as, a, as a guest and I, well you was, asked, you asked the actor if they'd wa watched uh you know the specific films yeah and of that era and and they replied no but i watched sunset boulevard oh yeah that killed me yeah I, yeah <laughs> i think it was the lady in question which is yeah. a, a 40s um, um anti-nazi war melodrama pastiche uh, yeah, so I asked this girl, I said, and it was based on very specific movies. Yeah, ha have you watched any of those films? Because clearly she didn't have a clue. She said, oh, oh well, I watched Sunset Boulevard, which has nothing to do with anything that we're, that we're doing. Yeah. Uh, oh, there was one thing. Was <laughs> so I think, I think part of that uh, visit, they, they, they got a lot out of me at that, that university. Uh, I was also supposed to do a... a one afternoon do a reading of any of my plays using a student with me playing my part and and the student cast so we did lily dare a reading of lily dare but i only i only got to rehearse them that oh 15 minutes before the audience came in and so it was just enough for me to say just you know you got to play it play it you know with a lot of energy loud a lot of energy but but you know be real honest just you know do do the story okay so so then so we did this reading and, and you know they 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 did okay and then this one young man uh, uh, I forget what role he was playing toward in the last scene was just being very qu quiet and uh, so I um, 
I whispered something in his ear and after it, while we were doing the, doing the scene and afterwards a friend of mine who lived in that area came to see this and he said, said I was just curious, what did you whisper in that young actor's ear in the last scene? I said, oh, I just said, goose it up, you're losing them. <laughs> I thought that was pretty good. Uh, pretty good note. Um, so I noticed uh, also on this Zoom today, uh, we have Tom Judson. Where is and he? He's 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 on page two somewhere, and uh, and that's a perfect segue actually because we've got a couple questions in the chat, and I want to remind folks if you would like to ask a question. Um, to our fabulous guests today, please pop it in the chat. Um, one of our questions came from Jim, uh, who is wondering about how uh, Tom Judson and Charles developed the songs for the show together. Well, maybe does Tom want to, can Tom speak? I don't know, maybe he's not, I guess he's not really on the, I don't know if it works that way. Well, anyway, I'll, I'll just say, uh, Tom okay. Judson is, great great friend of mine and we've been we've known each other for oh gosh you know um over 30 years but we started working together as as he's a brilliant musician and he and pianist and so he's been my musical director for my cabaret act for the past 13 years and i knew that we needed a couple of songs and so i i uh and tom has written many musicals but he's he's very very good at, at um pastiche so I, I said, so we need a song that uh, when Lily becomes this great cabaret artiste and uh, it should be, I think I said a, a very sort of, uh, passage of, of Dietrich songs by uh, Friedrich Hollander and maybe a, a bit of Port Vile. And he just went off and came back with Pi Pirate Jenny. And it was just, Perfect. I mean, it, it, you know, it moves from the the tone of um, oh, uh, what are some of the Dietrich songs? A little bit of uh, Black Market, and then it kind of gets real lively. It's a little bit of the tone of uh, the boys in the back room, and oh, it's supremely actable. He, he's you know, and, so so talented. And, and we were lucky. Tom was in San Francisco, I think, for forty eight hours, and he spent. A couple of those hours uh, coming to the new conservatory and and uh, playing the song for uh, Conrad and look the the pirate show is a joy to say it's very Kurt Viley and very Dietrichy um, and it goes through a wide range of emotions and is a fabulous showcase um, in the middle of the show just to to act the heck out of it and um, it's just fun to do and I've also loved doing the other number in the show which is uh, a shanty an old shanty town from the nineteen thirty three no, uh, it's the 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 cag. What, what's the name of the movie? The, the movie's the Roaring Twenties. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of my favorite movies. Um, and it, Gladys George, one of my favorite actresses, uh, plays uh, Pan, I think her name is Panama Smith, and she's sort of a Texas guy in a nightclub hostess. And at the the movie goes from the twenties to after Prohibition, and and she's on on the skids, and she's singing in a. a some sort of gin joint and and she sang um it's only a shanty an old shanty town so i've always loved that song from that moment so therefore when i needed a song that lily would sing when she's down and out uh, yeah. that seemed it's, perfect it's great because it allows you she starts out um you know singing to the boys in the back and sort of breaks down to do it as a ballad um right in the show, which was is highly effective, um, beautifully shows this transition and what Lily's become, you know, after being a, ma a cabaret star and a madam, and now sort of down, down and out. Um, so now, did just Tom? Tom did um, did do you ever did you write out a piano transcription of that? And is that what is that what you you're, you're singing from? Yes, we were yeah. singing from that, but the piano the piano transcription doesn't um, tell you that there's a breakdown. So I was looking at it, I'm like what is happening here? And then Tom's like, oh, it's this. And I was like, oh, well, now I understand. Yeah, but so- oh, and did so, you, and do you have the, did you, uh, I, I never asked you, I, there was a little bit that I wrote in the middle of kind of, um, you know, a couple lines 
I didn't. Risk, I don't know if we. If we oh no, I never. Them. I never had. Well, I I can add them this week. I had to. I broke <laughs> up the line of poker face ghouls. Watching them is the same as uh, watching a, a French poodle drag a milk cart. Uh, I did that in the middle. Uh, but, yeah, no, there was like there was like this sort of little couple lines of verse that I threw in oh, there. Yeah, there's the verse. We have that. The um uh is uh. Some of you might think my man's a no good fake. Oh um, yeah, that's it. I wrote. I wrote yeah, those ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah I do okay. that. Oh, I do that, that Charles. Yeah. So, yeah, so, okay. so when one when one leases the rights to your play, that uh, also Tom's songs um, are, are are leasable also. So we were able to do that. So, okay. so that's good. Um, we have one additional question from the chat, and then we'll start to wrap up. If anyone has additional questions, please feel free to pop them into the chat. Um, our next question came from Robin, who says, I really enjoyed the wonderful songs. Can you speak to what were your musical influences, which you've touched on a little bit, but if there was yeah. anything else you'd like to add? No, I think, I think we, answered the, we ended up answering Robin's question. Yeah. I did take them up a step, Charles. <laughs> <laughs> um, just so that I could, I'm sometimes I'd lend you to lo lower <laughs> register that I use. <laughs> uh, but it, I think it, we're still getting the same Dietrich -y effect in it. It's, it's marvelous. But you don't you don't sing it in your counter. No, 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 no. no. no do, you do, do, you, do you sing in the in the in the second scene uh, when Lily's doing a little vocally operatic vocally? We discussed it. We discussed it, but we figured since um, Louise is lip syncing yeah. to opera later on. It's it's funnier that um, I'm lip syncing to the uh, a cadenza of uh, Ch uh, Cecilia Bartoli's uh, of San Mario, I can't remember which one it is, okay. uh, for my section. Yeah. Right, okay. Um, that, that's obviously what I did, yeah. Yeah, so um, before we wrap up, um, so a little while ago, um, Charles wrote a, a, a lovely book a novel, The Whores of Lost Atlantis, which I believe is sort of semi-autobiographical, -auto but yeah, now, right. now there's an actual, <laughs> sincerely autobiographical uh, book coming out, isn't there? Yeah, September 12th is publication date, although um, it's available on Amazon for pre-order or wherever fine books are sold. Yeah, I'm so excited about it. I've, I've, I've really only worked on the book for 14 years but it's finally uh finally coming out and it, it, it was odd because i had you know, in 1996 written this um uh novel that was very much based on uh how we first did vampire lesbians of sodom in the east village and my theater company and how we moved off broadway but it's highly fictionalized but but based in fact and it, it was quite difficult this time around, actually trying to write the truth. And, you know, I, I had told the story so many times and I'd even turned it into cabaret banter, you know, in, a, in a, one of the acts that Tom and I have done. And so now, now to try to really delve into what, what was I really feeling? What, what you know, what the, is the truth? Because fr frankly, the, the, the even people, in my life who were involved in my theater company has have come to believe the stories in the novel as truth. And I have to remind them sometimes that never happened. I just made that up. You know, we're all so confused at this point. But th with this new book, I really was trying to, to get back. And, and, and then of course, after I, after I finished the book and it's, it was proofread, it's at the, you know, the publisher, I mean, it's being printed out. I went into, I looked into some old drawer here, the forbidden drawer, and and found like eight diaries that I had kept during this period that I didn't know. And I, and I haven't dared open them because I'm terrified that I'll see things like, oh no, why didn't I put that in the book? But I'm, I'm, I'm trying to believe that it's all for the best, that, that uh, somehow the veil of memory is, is actually better than if I knew the truth. <laughs> yeah. and, and Conrad, uh, you don't have a book coming out, but you just celebrated no. a big anniversary. I, did. I celebrated 18 years of my monthly show at Martuni's, um, which has okay. been 
wonderful a chance to go and sing there uh you know once a month every third sunday and i'll be writing a new show um with new music uh for feinstein's at the hotel nico uh which will be september i want to say fourth and fifth but that may be totally inaccurate it'll be katia i did it my way a master class or new additions to the great american songbook um so I'm looking forward to actually getting to put some pen to paper um, and write some new material and some uh, new arrangements. And uh, Charles, are you hard at work on a new show for Conrad to star in and me to direct? <laughs> I'm still well, waiting for the idea question. <laughs> I have a new I have a new play that we're going to do in, um, uh, in the winter. Um, first, at, it's a joint production between Marvel Theater in New Jersey called the. Um, uh, um, blank, blank, uh, the George Street Playhouse, New Brunswick. And, and then we go immediately in, into doing it in New York at Primary Stages Theater Company. And it's called Ibsen's Ghost. And I play um, Ibsen's widow, Susanna Ibsen, uh, the week after the great man's uh, state funeral. And oh my, all things, ha hell's a popping. <laughs> Well, so that, that, that's Conrad and I will 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 look forward to doing that in a couple of years. So. <laughs> well, that'd be quite a while because she's a much older older woman. She's it's it's one of my first uh, age appropriate roles I've ever played. <laughs> <laughs> well, then maybe I'll play the role and Conrad will direct. So. Yes, I mean, maybe I'll do that then. I'm fine with that. I like directing. <laughs> Wherever your creativity goes, we'll be there for it. I want to give a huge thank you to our special guests this afternoon, playwright Charles Bush, performer J. Conrad Frank, and director F. Allen Sawyer for joining us here at Mechanics Institute to discuss uh, their creative process, creating and delivering the confession of Lily Dare, which is playing now at New Conservatory Theater Center in San Francisco. The last show is June 11th, so please make sure that you go and see this wildly funny, absolutely touching, delightful, creative show at New Conservatory Theatre Center. So we are very, very pleased um, that we had this moment together, uh, and we are grateful to our special guests. Thank you all so much for joining us. Have a wonderful afternoon. Please check out milibrary.org to see all of our future events that we offer here on site at Mechanics Institute and virtually for wherever you might be across the country and globe. Thank you again for joining us this afternoon with Mechanics Institute and our special guests, Charles Bush, J. Conrad Frank, and F. Allen Sawyer. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you so much. Okay. Bye. Bye.